Welcome to the Phase World Podcast, engaging conversations that cross the boundaries between business, art, and the digital world. This process is not unlike the process as a painter, and I enjoy preparing my material from the ground up, laying the field, preparing the paper. I also learned that the subject weed. Most people have some personal story they can tell and and to share. So it is a very fundamental. Elements in everyone's life. This is a fundamental needs for me is is to observe and to look. And I, but throughout this project, just the privilege of looking even more broad,、uh, very deep thoughts and contemplation in my consciousness. So artist does have to make a living. There are things that they make to sell, and there are things they make to advance themselves.、Mm-hmm. So, this might be big challenge for most of us.、Mm-hmm. New York City、mm-hmm. gave me the permission and and the route to become an artist. It was slow coming.、Uh, it took me a long time, but steadily, I, I worked very hard. To be able to have a voice, hey everyone, this is Fei Wu again, and welcome to a new episode of the Phase World Podcast. Today, I would like to welcome a new guest, Wen Hao. Tian, who is a visual artist, educator, and assistant director of Boston University's Party School of Global Studies and Regional Studies, at the New Art Center in Newton, Massachusetts, between September 22nd and October 19th, 2017, Wen Hao is showcasing a new collection, or what I call an artistic experiment, with wild weeds she found outside her home. I had the pleasure to visit her studio in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where she transferred those wild weeds into a home garden and planted them on purpose. Along the way, she took pictures of these plants before they found their new home, and also pictures of herself and people she encountered. This installation contemplates the idea of wantedness and unwantedness, control and letting go. Alienation and belonging, as well as the holiness of our society. First, I was puzzled by this, but very quickly through our conversation, I understood the act and intention behind it. On my way home that day, I began to notice things. Wen Hao grew up in Taiwan and later moved to the United States to pursue graduate studies. She began her academic pursuits with biomedical sciences, and then to social studies and to visual arts. Her studio artwork focuses on language and translation, and explores culture and identity through a unique cross-cultural lens. In addition to Wen Hao's new collection named Weed Out, I was eager to ask her about her journey in becoming an artist. How does someone learn to become an artist? Where does it begin? Are there any shortcuts? Wen Hao couldn't be more honest. From her early days and years as a student living not far from New York City, to attending workshops at a local studio that became a turning point for her as an artist, she even shared the path of finding New Art Center as a partner and educator, and eventually the outlet for her work. We have included resources for you to further explore on FaceWorld.com. And perhaps you will share this conversation with friends too. Please consider subscribing to this podcast. It really helps us build our audience for these unsung heroes and self-made artists. It takes seconds. Simply search for a Face World, 
F-E-I-S-W-O-R-L-D on any podcast app and hit the subscribe button. Alternatively, you can also visit our website, phaseworld.com, and click on the hamburger menu, select listen and subscribe. It will automatically open up our podcast via your selected podcast app. Without further ado, please welcome Wen Hao Tian to the Phase World podcast. So thank you so much for inviting me to your home and also your studio to talk about your artworks and also your new exhibition called Weed Out. Yeah, so could you tell us a bit about, I mean, it's upcoming. When, where is it going to be in case some of my listeners in Massachusetts can probably make their way there? That would be wonderful. I'm very excited about this exhibition, so I would love to see you there. So it's Weed Out at New Art Center, Newton, 64 Washington Park. So that's Weed Out. When I first heard the name, there were a lot of different thoughts in my mind, as you can imagine, as marijuana was just legalized and, uh, and all that jazz. But give us an idea of what, what is this about? I mean, what are some of the materials? Yes. So you're right. In this exhibition, I, I want to really honor the most important elements in the making and the process of this, this uh, body of work. So I'm using plants and to make a living sculpture inside the gallery. These plants are things that um, if you live in an urban environment and have a garden and care about your garden, and these are the things you most likely will pull out, mm-hmm. pull them out when, when you notice them. So these plants are normally um, okay when they're unnoticed, but when they are noticed, they are being pulled out. That's the criteria the for, for my definition of weed. <laughs> weed as in weed out as in people typically pull them out. And I remember that when I was a little girl watching my parents, my grandparents plant out different flowers. And when they see sort of these wild grass or, or wheat, they just pull them out as if they're absorbing nutrition from the plants we're trying to actually plant out. But yeah. you are observing them and then making them into artworks and capturing them on purpose. Yes, because I I am a very enthusiastic gardener. I've had my own garden since 1996, and I spent a lot of time in the garden. And to a degree that I got really bored. I, I got really bored in my garden and everybody else's garden. And I realized for the most part, we um, our visual consumption is, kept, is based on what's being sold in the store. Mm-hmm. And I, uh, I got bored and I was looking for, for the real deal in the age, edge of our, our city and things that people pull out. Mm-hmm. It's interesting. I f- you reminded me of the thought of beauty when we open up a, a magazine as in we should wear certain clothes because we are familiar with them. And, or, you know, I, I live close enough to Russo's where I see a ton of people going in there every day to, you know, these pre-planned flowers in a little pot, and then people buy 15 or 20 at a time, and they look beautiful. You know, what is your idea? What are your thoughts on why people go after that, and then somehow you're going the other way? I mean, what, I feel it's on? more like a fashion, and me being an experienced gardener in this area, I would be uh, looking at the plant and say, oh, that was, no, that is new. It only came out last year. It's a new hybridized version and I want to get at myself because it's uh, exotic looking. Mm-hmm. People don't see that a lot in everybody's garden, but it's like a fashion, new uh, new clothes. And of course, not everybody's garden is, is up to date. <laughs> Let me put it this way. Yeah. <laughs> but I think it's a consumption and you continue producing refreshing new look. And so people are attracted and will buy them. So I saw some pictures. I had the privilege uh, to kind of follow you around the house and get to see your website. But what intrigued me is the fact that there are pictures of you walking around, you know, where we are right now, around the Cambridge area of Massachusetts, and pictures of you dragging these little cards and you pictures of you bending down, you know, next to a gigantic tree, and pulling the weed out to be able to take them with you. 
So tell me about that journey. Where have you been? Do you mark your territory? So at the beginning was was a very pure visual attraction of these sort of less noticeable plants in our environment. And when I notice them every single time, it feels like a new discovery. And alongside of that discovery, I discover a lot of other things that you normally don't see when you walk around an urban area. But now, now I pay attention to them. So this process is not unlike a process as a painter, and I enjoy preparing my material from the ground up, laying the field, preparing the paper. Uh, I, I'm a paper person, so I, I can't tell you that I prepared a canvas, but preparing the material. And I feel this journey of dragging, a, a, I call it a weed mobile, a buggy <laughs> around, um, is part of preparing, laying out a field of my um, thoughts and it's a big part of the process. Mm-hmm. And I, I encounter curiosities. Some people will talk to you, some won't. Um, and I also observe some people taking weeds, just like me. So I ask them questions. What do you want? What are you doing with these weeds? And I learned quite a lot of um, species that you can put as part of your dish. Or mm-hmm. And we have a lot of food. <laughs> that we can use. We can use. Yeah. Uh, and I'm learning from these people. And I also, I also learned that the subject, weed, most people have some personal stories they can tell and, and to share. So it is a very fundamental element in everyone's life. Mm-hmm. It, it's interesting that there's so much of our lives that we overlook because we are in a hurry, because we're under stress, or because we are so conditioned to do certain things, such as the things on my list to do, a list of to-dos today, going to meetings and follow-ups. But when I slow down, as I have paid attention to my lifestyle change significantly two years ago when I pursued my career as a freelancer now, so I don't work full-time for anybody, I noticed the freedom I gained and all the observations I had and things that I wouldn't have done One example would be, um, I live in Newton and I was driving towards Needham and I was going to see another friend of mine. And in between Needham and where I was going to be, I ended up in this like very mysterious place. And uh, I think that name was gonna, it's a very wealthy town with a lot of horses and all that. I, I just remember wanting to pull over and pay attention to the scenery for the first time, possibly in like five to 10 years of driving in Massachusetts because I feel like I don't need to pay attention. I live here. I've seen everything. I know everything. But there you are, kind of said, what if we just look down where my feet are right here, right? And to discover some of that. What have you noticed, like that, those inner thoughts, I guess the conversation you've had with yourself in this process? I, I'm, on the other hand, I think I, I spend too much time looking around where, where, <laughs> what's around me. I gaze and not daydream, but I gaze and I, this is a fundamental needs for me is, is to observe and to look. And I, but throughout this project, just the privilege of looking even more mm-hmm. broad, uh, very deep thoughts and contemplation in my consciousness by giving myself a permission, a legitimate reason to even looking and idle or searching, discovering Jahan and brought me to an area of thoughts I, I never was um, able to reach. Mm-hmm. So some values, for example, um, who is wanted and what is wanted and what's unwanted, why, and control, a people's desire to control. For example, control what's growing in your garden and pulling out the weeds mm-hmm. and letting go, letting go that impulse. Because when... When something appears in your garden you didn't put in there, mm-hmm. it takes a lot to get used to it. Mm-hmm. So instead of trying to get used to it, letting go, let something live, it's easier just to put them out. And I also observe a lot of issues pertaining immigration mm-hmm. that we are confronted by today mm-hmm. in our society. The idea that you brought up native or not, I thought that was such an interesting concept that what's native to us. I mean, growing up in Beijing back in the 1980s, there weren't nearly as many faces that weren't uh, familiar to us. 
And then very quickly in the early 90s, you see people from all around the world, Caucasians, people from Africa. I mean, just really incredible. During our conversation just now, you know, the, the use of the word native became a kind of a focal point that what is considered native? I mean, neither you nor I were born and raised in this country. But now looking around nearly all my friends, I mean, their grandparents, great-grandparents were not from this country. And then we can keep going backwards, right? I think the answer is very clear who were the original natives. And nobody living in this country, United States, is native. I agree with you. Mm -hmm. And I didn't grow up here, but I spent almost 30 years in the New England area. And I feel I'm as native many, many, many of my neighbors. And, but sometimes I do, my, I make a mistake, also assume who is native, who is, uh, who is not native. Mm -hmm. And I surprise myself. Sometimes by the look, I thought this person is native. And I, after talking to this person, and you know, you never know. You really never know. And the world has been open for such a long time. I think most of us are a hybridized mm -hmm. version of some heritage. Mm -hmm. What makes your work stand out in ways that I've, I have discovered since we're trying to schedule this interview back in April? And back then, I started looking at your website. And more recently, just now, you know, we sat down and looked at some of the projects you have been working on at Boston University and prior to that at Harvard. And I noticed that integration and incorporation does not single out just Asian or Chinese art in particular, but you're empowering and also mixing it in a good way of other arts out there. So could you tell us a bit about your work, perhaps outside of your own studio here at home, but what you do? I feel, I feel um, they are very similar, at least from my part. The difference is uh, this, my studio work, I, I drive, I drive the idea. And, and nowadays, even my studio work, I incorporate other other people's efforts, and I am a big fan of working collectively. Mm -hmm. So my work at Harvard and at BU, for the most part, we work as a group. We brainstorm idea, and my role in these organizations is to detect mm -hmm. interesting ideas and projects and brainstorm and build a community of interest. More inclusive is more interesting, <laughs> generally speaking. Mm -hmm. And the time has changed. When I started working at Harvard in 1996, and compared to what we do you know, now, um, in Asia study even alone, it's different. Mm -hmm. And I would say it's even more integrative now. Mm -hmm. Your background growing up, I mean, for the first maybe 20 or so years of your life in, in Taiwan is... It, very interesting to me. For there are many reasons. One that you were a scientist, really. You were almost born as a scientist. That's something that that came easy to you. And I want you to talk a, a little bit about that because you were quote unquote not native artist, but you were a very talented scientist, and you kind of sh made a shift and transition. Tell me a little more about that. Well, I think my academic pursuit. Uh, is a was a very long one, and I started. I, w I was selected as a biological science student uh, quite young. I have shown science. I, I'm not saying people forcing me to that, mm -hmm. but I sh I, since I was very little, I have shown uh, very strong science and been very curious about living living objects. So that was that was my base fundamental academic training until graduate school. Mm -hmm. And I made a shift to social studies through studying at School of Public Health at Columbia University. And during my affiliation at Harvard, Harvard University and Boston University, I continued taking courses to fill in any part of knowledge that I, I need, mm -hmm. but hasn't been acquired. 
And but all along, I've had a practice in 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 making art uh, more intensively since I arrived in the United States、mm-hmm. in 1988. So I would say New York City、mm-hmm. gave me the permission and and the route to become an artist. It was slow coming.、Uh, it took me a long time, but steadily, I I worked very hard to be able to. Have a voice、mm-hmm. from the media that I'm, I'm I'm choosing to work with. What was that transition like? I mean, knowing that Columbia is kind of close to New York City for some of the international listeners who may not know the kind of uh, uh, geographic location、oh. of Columbia. So, what was it like for you to transition or really utilize your resources in in New York? Well, first of all, I, <laughs> I became very free. I I I'm not. Living with my parents, so my I became very free. And New York City has a lot of different people.、Mm-hmm. I heard from、um, a former ambassador that there are two thousand different kind of people in in New York City.、Mm-hmm. That blew me away, and I I don't really know what the two thousand different kind of people are, but I I've met a lot of different people, so.、Mm-hmm. I feel I'm one of them, and I feel very free.、Mm-hmm. And Columbia University is is in in Manhattan, in New York City,、mm-hmm. and in the lower lower west side,、mm-hmm. there are many、uh, studios and galleries and a room around. And I also、um, take a lot of classes, and I join a studio and had some intense productive years. <laughs> and the studio. It, Is a clay studio,、mm-hmm. so we use clay as、uh, a building material and found objects, all kinds of pigment and and stuff you can use for for paint. That was really really eye opening experience,、mm-hmm. and from there I began my artistic practice and and start to know what what works and what not works. Is、mm-hmm. another experiment outside of my. Outside of my laboratory,、mm-hmm. part of what I love、um, discovering as this podcast through people I call unsung heroes and self-made artists、yeah. in this way, you you fall under the my tagline precisely well is the journey before you get to where you are today, and so much of that, just like weed out, were ignored, neglected, never talked about again. So recently, I listened to Jerry Seinfeld, a very I mean, world famous comedian, an interview of him、uh, with Terry from Fresh Air from eighty seven, nineteen eighty seven. That's two years before he signed a contract to have the TV show Seinfeld, and to hear Jerry Seinfeld to talk about his making of himself, just like the way you talk about the Clay Studio,、uh, to me that's priceless because oftentimes as we Both now, artists these days seem as successful and incredibly commercialized. When I see them, kind of reaching that stage, on one hand, I'm happy that they don't have to be starving artists anymore, and and also if they could enable other young artists by providing them with the resources and and tools, that would be great. But on the other hand, I, I feel like they start to lose a real sense of what the purpose of art really is in. Something you said about like kind of your genre is to notice something that's usually not noticeable by the majority of the people, and turning that into art. But how how do you process? How do you interpret? Or I'm sure there may be other young artists coming to you these days to say, "How do I navigate my own career? How have you done it for yourself?" I think、um, another shout out <laughs> here is、um, so find that clay clay studio, ceramic studio. Experience, nineteen ninety two, to today is been a long time. So I've gone through many journeys, and in between, I I focused on traditional Chinese calligraphy and painting, and then from there, move on to experimental, but Chinese ink work, ink art, and so so that's one journey. And then throughout that journey, they were. State must usually stay sponsored grants and opportunities, which I want to endorse them. So Massachusetts Cultural Council.、Mm-hmm. But moving away from that, I 
needed to find a community of, pra- community of practitioners. Mm-hmm. Similar to my experience at the Greenwich House Pottery, I need to find a community of practitioners that are into what I wanted to do with art. And I found Leslie University, College of Arts oh. and Design, <laughs> Lucate. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I'm enrolled there as a Master of Fine Art student. So it's a fantastic group, and uh, I fit right in. So I'm repeating my experience in the early 1990s and feeling extremely productive. Mm -hmm. So I think finding your community Mm -hmm. is very important. Mm -hmm. How did you find out about Leslie? Um, A fluke. (laughs) But but at at the very beginning, it was a fluke. But, um, no, there were doubts. Because I work and I have a family and I produce art. And now going to school, that's another really big deal. Mm-hmm. So I kept my doubts. But again, I'm going in, I, I, I understand what was missing from my art practice before going in. Mm-hmm. So continuing this process of learning with them, I, I feel it was the right thing. And I just... Keep going. Mm-hmm. I'm in the middle of it. I'm I'm half halfway, but already I felt it was was the right right relationship. How do you know that it's the right relationship? So for an artist of any kind, whether you're you know fine artist and you're experimenting something, you're a photographer or you're a podcaster, how do you know that you've found the right environment? Because I think once you do, it becomes obvious. But when you, it's hard to win translate what what that is so could you give that a shot sure yeah <laughs> um so i i heard you're saying honest and honesty i think i think you just really have to be honest to yourself in every senses you have as an artist and i had throughout the process of the schooling in the studio practice i kept going to the direction of catching myself, catching my thoughts, catching what I'm doing. And if I'm observing, I'm going this way, and I catch it, and I say, oh, maybe I'll do it a different way. I'll do it the other way, and I explore. So and as I explore, I kept catching myself, and I'm going this way again, and let me go that way. Mm-hmm. And when I presented to my community what I have done, when people can detect, people supported me with that journey and mm-hmm. detected the value and gave me very um, valuable suggestions and, and compare my work to some other, to mm-hmm. other artists that they know. I think that was, that was my journey. And, and so far, then I could be extremely honest with, with the process and with support mm-hmm. from my community and none of my exploration was suppressed. Mm-hmm. And so far, so good. And I feel like I'm landing, landing on projects and work that has legs, mm-hmm. that evolve itself from one project and evolve to the next and evolve to the next, mm-hmm. almost simultaneously. Mm-hmm. So I'm grateful for, for my community mm-hmm. of practitioners. Mm-hmm. There's something parallel to what you said that reminds me of if anybody out there has had a shrink or a psychologist before. I know, and unfortunately, many of the people who have not had that experience, what I learned is when they ask you the right questions, instead of answering them for you, such as you should do this, you should do that. That's usually a, a sign of not a very good psychologist, you know. Rather, they ask you the right question. They listen carefully and respond with something that provides you with possibilities and that space for you to think about. You know, you could do A, and here's what I think. You could also do B or C. And it sounds like that community is giving you that leverage almost to truly support you so that you can still think independently. And I couldn't emphasize that enough as an artist who absolutely needs to think independently. Otherwise, it's so easy for a bad community, for example, where people come together and they literally produce the exact same artworks, right? So we've all seen that happen as well. So whoever, whether the person in charge or whether there's a salesperson, whether 
you know, you're basically aligning yourself to what sells and, you know, what's seen uh, as popular. Uh, I think you, at that point, probably you're a lot more likely to fail. Like you said, if catching myself and, and also observe what everybody's doing, maybe I'll go do something else. Yeah, I think, I think um, it's intense questioning. Mm-hmm. I'm doing A, and why are you doing A? And in this A, there's this components, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, mm-hmm. eight, nine, ten. Why are you doing the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten? Mm-hmm. And I have to look at all these questions. And I'm not saying defending myself, mm-hmm. but throughout the process, I find the reason why am I doing this. And if the reason isn't strong, I'm trying something else. So artists does have to make a living. Mm-hmm. There are things that they make to sell, and there are things they make to advance themselves. Mm -hmm. So this might be a big challenge for most of us. Mm -hmm. So what do you do to sell? And what do you do to advance yourself? It's a big question. Mm -hmm. We should definitely explore that. I think this is an area where I've interviewed several artists on the show, and everybody has a different way of approaching that. And sometimes doing things that sell almost sounds like a sacrifice in some cases. I know I have to do that to pay rent, to pay this and that. But but I think that I I had a period of time that I paint, painted and I had exhibition and I sold a work. And to be honest with you, the best work got picked out first. So it's kind of gratifying because it's your best work. People know that's good work. So it can be gratifying. So I would say just in my own experiences, don't underestimate your view, the viewers, mm-hmm. the, the consumers, and you will find you do good work and you will be picked out. Yeah. you know, a slightly opposite experience. And I found fascinating as well, where my mom last year joined Red Cross and basically donated all her paintings and so that they're sold to the public. And she and I worked together on selecting the pieces. There are about 30 or so, quite a number of them. And we both knew which one was going to sell first, the colorful. I mean, this is very specific to an area of China. And they were all sold with one exception, And that one exception is a very faded rice uh, paper, um, kind of uh, old traditional with very light uh, ink uh, outline, gongbi, meticulous painting. And that one's so quiet and sophisticated, but we're still very happy about that, you know? And I think we weren't turned down by it either. You know, it's certainly, we love all the other works, but sometimes there's something unique about it that's left behind. And... We were okay. Yeah, yeah. It's better <laughs> off that you kept it because you'll miss it. You'll miss it if it's been sold. <laughs> but that also means if it's in a different mm-hmm. environment, that piece will be the only one that is sold. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> right? no, exactly. It was a different exhibition. This one in particular, we're not open to artists, more for the general public. It's interesting. I think you were, we're basically talking about the same thing. Like you said, what you, the categories of what sells versus what will advance you. So do you think it's important for artists to maybe balance that as their growth? You know, look at whether it's a six month or a year plan to say, I'm coming from a project management perspective (laughs) to say, maybe I shouldn't spend 40, 80 hours a week focusing only on things that sell. Maybe I need to be aware of that and dedicate some sufficient time for me to explore things that will challenge me, that therefore will, will advance me. So I personally... I'm driven by driven by a high high very high goal mm-hmm. of what really satisfies me emotionally, intellectually through mm-hmm. through my work through my art. I think that's why I hold a job outside mm-hmm. because I that's my uh, top goal is to how does this practice satisfy my curiosity. So I didn't choose to to make art and sell, mm-hmm. but I felt um, I could balance I could 
create a balance by going for that goal, but at the crossroad when some pieces can be generated、mm-hmm. for consumption,、mm-hmm. I could put aside time to generate those pieces、mm-hmm. to be sold.、Mm-hmm. But I still, you know, the project, the art, was going. But when you are at certain junctions, I could produce. Things and, and and those items can be seen as a product.、Mm-hmm. I don't mind that. It just I didn't have enough time right now.、Mm-hmm. Um, but maybe that that time will come.、Mm-hmm. And also the we're talking a little bit about marketing and promoting a, an artist. Some of that effort, a lot of that type of effort, isn't linear, isn't super straightforward. And using your weed out insulation as an example. It doesn't sound like you are pulling, selling these pots of plant, right? But it's more of leaving people with an expression, impression that won't be forgotten very soon, right? Make them think about their own lives, and therefore becomes your own brand of who you are and how you differentiate yourself from a vast of other artists out there. So we talked about creating a collection, your thought pattern, but how do you go about finding? The location where the people you want to connect with and say, "Hey, let's let's do this together." Do you have an agent? Do you go about doing this yourself? Well, at, at this moment, again, I have a I have an intense, you know, demanding job,、mm-hmm. and I am an artist, and I'm a I'm a I have a family, so I I go with my community that I cultivate and maintain relationship with.、Mm-hmm. So, for example, in Newton. And in Cambridge,、mm-hmm. so I know it's very important for artists to maintain a social media presence,、mm-hmm. to broaden their engagement, and I am in the process of doing that as well.、Mm-hmm. So, for example, this Weed Out project can be seen as a beginning, and I am very hoping to do. Doesn't have to be exact this project, but similar project in different community. So. I think your setup and your background is certainly in modern art, and whereas you know I've been conditioned by my family coming from a very traditional art background that my mom spent forty years at the Forbidden City tracing our works, and、um, so but I also see her transitioning into kind of this emerging into this new world、uh, because it's necessary. What's your what's your vision in terms of you know traditional? I mean, there's so many definitions for traditional. It, Even just within Chinese art itself, but how do you kind of see the two worlds emerge versus you know、so、separated? I I I think traditional arts are beautiful. I myself spent number of years wanted to be good at it.、Mm-hmm. So I think the process, my process of learning the traditional art, namely Chinese calligraphy and brush painting and rice paper and all that. Was an intense journey, you know, training, learning how to embody、uh, some essence, some、mm-hmm. some kind of essence that doesn't exist、mm-hmm. in the current world. But you saw the beauty and the essence. You want to take. You want to.、Mm-hmm. You want to be able to make it and show it to the world.、Mm-hmm. But I needed to energize the media.、Mm-hmm. In order to show the world and have people understand what I'm showing,、yeah. <laughs> if I kept the same way,、um, I'm not sure how successful I am to communicate the、yeah. beauty and essence I saw from the antiquity. So even as I was preparing this weed out project, I have some very clear direction of how. I make this living sculpture speak. An artist, at least, I have to make it beautiful, beautiful in my own terms. So, how do I bring out the beauty I see, the the type of beauty I I see? And it went back to my the things I saw from antiquity.、Mm-hmm. Some of those, probably not from a garden center, but it's from some some essence I saw through my. Practice as an artist in traditional art. This is fascinating because I notice a lot of your work is triggering thoughts and also make art 
less intimidating, right? It's there. You mentioned there's a there's a collection that you showed me with your all the sticks that your son picked out when he was younger, and how you rearranged them using them as strokes of Chinese characters. I haven't thought about that, but now if I look back to when I was a little kid. Of course, we did that. We wrote with the sticks on the ground in the dirt, and we arranged them. But I feel like this was, when I saw that, I felt like I, I could connect with myself from 25 years ago, which is kind of magical. I'm so glad you're doing this because you're you're in a way not simplifying, but making it much easier, even possible, to communicate where you're coming from, and so that people. Can take those first few steps, and they want to keep looking further into who you are as an artist, and hopefully even beyond yourself into what traditional art is about. Maybe that's Chinese art, maybe that's Malaysian art, maybe that's traditional American art. And you know, I'm trying to look for the word, but you become, you help kind of translate and becomes that intermediary. Person to make that happen, which I have seen for many years, thirty, fifty years, that hasn't really been possible. So I think through your collections, you you're doing just that. Thank you. <laughs> the reason why I pick out certain certain pictures, it, it indeed signify the Chinese characters,、mm-hmm. and I think the viewer appreciated it.、Um, I don't label them as Chinese characters, but they feel this is, this is of language.、Mm-hmm. So. So a big part of my journey is to interpret language in translation, language in translation in in our world, and the Weed Out project has a component of picking out foreign airborne words in the lang- in, in the English language you are speaking every day. So I'm very excited about it, and I hope a lot of you will have a chance to visit. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you so much, Wenhao, for thank you, Fei, for joining me. Hey, it's Fei. I am back for a few words at the end of the show. I hope you enjoy what you heard. You can visit us online at faceworld dot com or social channels such as Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, also under Face World, to keep things simple. I personally review and respond to all the messages. Love to hear from you. Thank you, and lots of hugs. See you next week.